Um, my name is Stephen Farthing. I am an artist, painter and professor of drawing at the University of the Arts. Today is the 10th of October uh, 2014 and I'm going to talk to you about drawing, my subject of specialism. Um, I think I should start by saying that um, drawing, in my mind, is a very simple and straightforward activity. But once you start to try and explain what drawing is, it becomes rather complicated. Because most people, when they start to think about drawing, think about the stuff they did in the art room at school. Um, stuff that relates to what Rembrandt did or what uh, Raphael did. They don't think about street markings, skid marks left on a road, vapour trails left by aeroplanes, maybe even the slime left by a snail as it moves across the ground. They don't think about engineering drawings. They often don't even think about architects' drawings. What they think about is the business of can I draw? And can I draw always seems to relate to something to do with drawing people, animals, fictional superheroes, or landscapes. Now, what I'm going to talk to you about today is the bigger picture of drawing. This whole big world where drawing, writing, notation, that is notation of music or dance, are all part of this family that I can best describe as uh, two-dimensional representations. These two-dimensional representations, whether they're numbers, words or lines, in the end reduce very complex, often very complex, multi-dimensional events to a more simple form, a two-dimensional image. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about and I'm going to use examples of my own drawings to do this. As um, I can do it as a history lesson um, and start with um, uh, cave drawings and work my way through to Damon Hurst. But uh, somehow um, it, it, you can get that anywhere. So I'm going to use my drawings so that you get to know something about an individual as we work our way through this bigger picture. So when I arrived in the University of the Arts some 10 years ago, uh, to become the professor of drawing, I decided that my approach to beginning to understand drawing was to make a drawing of drawing. Now, this is my first attempt. I saw drawing as a landscape. I saw it as having a kind of crest in the middle that was occupied by fine art, and then having design areas around it, and then beyond that, things like um, uh, street markings or um, you know, Photoshop, if that is drawing. And so I was trying to see it as a landscape. Now, as I progressed with my thinking, um, I became clearer that uh, I felt that somehow art was at the top of the mountain and then architecture and design was in the lower slopes of the mountain. And I've got over here tattoos. Those are very interesting kind of permanent drawings of the flesh. And then I had the markings on sports fields in a kind of valley after the first mountain. And then coming up out of that valley, Saxon chalk drawings. Um, those of you who don't know the English countryside, um, in the south there's a lot of chalk under the grass. And as far back as the Saxon culture, um, uh, people removed the grass from chalk slopes to reveal the white chalk underneath to make images on the hillsides, images that were supposed to be for the gods. Um, they were often horses, there's a horse down near Swindon, and at a place called Cern Abbas near Dorchester, there's a giant with a big club on the, on the hillside. On this same upper reach of this valley, I had cartography and um, road markings. And so it began to be a bit like the kind of cone of a volcano where the very top was art. Now, from there, I progressed to thinking about it in another way. This is another kind of drawing. So instead of viewing the drawing as a landscape, I viewed it as a tube map. Now this is clearly based on the London underground map that was designed by Harry Beck, who worked for London Transport, 
and he worked out this diagrammatic system of laying out the rail tracks and the interconnections between the rail tracks and the stations on the rail track, um, which has actually been copied all over the world. And now the Paris map, the Washington Metro has got an almost similar one, but it's not as good. And this has changed very little, apart from adding stations and lines, since the very first uh, maps that um, Harry Beck drew. Now, what I thought was that instead of having it represented as a landscape, I would have it represented as lines. So the green line is recording. I thought that was an important part of drawing. Um, the blue line is instructional. Um, an instructional drawing might be the iconic drawing of a female figure on a lavatory door. Uh, it's saying, men stay out, women, you may go in. Um, uh, all road markings are instructional, and we know what they mean because they have a text that accompanies them called the Highway Code. So I drew this map out, and I um, actually got it printed, and I called it the Plan de, de Design, the Plan of Drawing. And um, I now think it's an amusing object, and it was an interesting shift to go from landscape topography to a flat diagrammatic image, to try and draw exactly the same thing. But this, I felt, did not work, so I put it to one side. Now, Drawing what you are trying to understand is obviously a very important part of drawing. You, try, you use drawing as a way of unravelling the meaning of things. Now I just want to put those to one side now and talk to you a little bit about drawing. Now that is a drawing that I made from uh, a drawing that was made in ancient Egypt about three and a half thousand years ago, sorry, three and a half thousand years before Christ. And it was made with um, really the ancient equivalent of a felt-tip pen, or a sharpie as they're called in America, and that is that it was a reed, that the end of the reed had been chewed to make it fuzzy, and then dipped in ink and drawn with that. And that's how ancient Egyptians applied line to a surface. Now, the particular image that I'm showing you crops up a lot in ancient Egyptian art because there were probably quite a lot of cattle around, and so cattle were things that were important. They were probably a sign of wealth, um, certainly an indication of well-being and man's relationship with nature. But most important of all about these drawings were that ancient Egyptians drew with a great economy. And so if you study how these drawings are made, there is one continuous line that takes you all the way down the spine and all the way down the tail to the tip. And there is another continuous line that takes you from the neck through the stomach into the back leg and down into the hoof there. And that is, is pretty typical of all drawings of that period. Now, what we know when somebody starts to draw like that, here in the head, it goes under the chin, round the nose, up through the horn, back down the other side, over the top of the head, up the other horn, down and through the ear and round to there. That's one continuous line. What you know when you see lines like that is somebody cares. They're not just trying to make an image. They care where the line goes. They're trying to introduce something that in mathematics would be called elegance. And so, three and a half thousand years before Christ, which is roughly five and a half thousand years ago, people could see the sense in making beautiful lines whilst they made images of things. And I would say that's a very strong indicator that people are beginning to think about not just drawing, but the art of drawing and how a, an image can be beautiful. Um, this is a drawing that I made from um, a tablet that is in the British Museum. And it is actually a drawing lesson. What we know about um, uh, ancient Egyptian drawing is that when you see red and black in the same drawing, one is a correction of the other. Um, it, it, more often than not, teachers worked with red, and students worked with black. Now, what is interesting here is that there's clearly 
a lot of red. Usually in Egyptian drawings there's a lot of black because the student has done the drawing and then somebody's come along and just made a few corrections. Here we've actually got a lesson and you can see for example in this passage of figures how the teacher has drawn a basic stick figure and been asked to put some clothing on the figure and then the, stu so the student has drawn some covering on the figure and then drawn one of their own, there's no red on that, no corrections, where they have put together the teacher's image, what they were asked to practice here and there. And here you can see that the, um, uh, the, uh, a tracing lesson is going on where the student is being encouraged to draw over the top of the teacher's lines. This is a monkey with a long tail sitting and they've obviously been told to add the tail. So what we're looking at here is um, the beginnings of art education and the idea, uh, you know, well how do you learn to draw? By example, you look at other people's drawings and you work on from there. Um, here's one more drawing of a female figure. Look at these long and continuous lines just as they are with the cattle. Um, going round and down and up and round and up. And um, what I should tell you about these drawings is that um, you probably at school learned how um, uh, Egyptian drawings were all done to a grid and they were all mathematically correct. These are freehand drawings that are made out of stones that are about the size of my hand with one flat surface and then rounded at the back. And they are the stones that are chipped off of blocks whilst they were building the tombs. And they use them as sketching, practicing surfaces. They're called ostrica, O-S-T-R-I-K-A. And, um, and the singular of that is ostracon. There's a dog, a brilliant piece of tail and nose and chest. That's a whole big stretch going around there. And um, a stomach and back leg again. So, um, three, three and a half thousand years before Christ, people were doing very sophisticated freehand drawings. Now, there are obviously a lot of different ways of drawing. I've already shown you a landscaping approach to modeling a surface, a diagrammatic approach, in these, these drawings, trying to copy what you see, using a line to find an edge that gives you a shape that says dog. Now here is another kind of drawing where I'm going to show you two types of drawing working together. In a way, these two drawings are of exactly the same thing. This is a sketch that I did from a Pompeian wall drawing. So Pompeii um, was a, a town near Naples that was destroyed in a volcanic eruption in 79 AD. And it was a town that was occupied by relatively wealthy Roman families who decorated their walls of their villas with stories, paintings, beautiful decorative order, order of mural decoration. And so this is a sketch taken from one of those. Now this is an attempt at understanding how that fits into the history of art. And what I've said, so it does borrow something from this map. It borrows the idea of things running on coloured lines. So there's a kind of, I mean, a hybrid world here where I'm using a, a, a diagram to uh, talk about one aspect of a drawing or painting and then a more pictorially driven image to talk about the picture itself. So here I'm saying that there are three main forces that drive an image like this. There is the formal. Now the formal is about the arrangement, a border at the top, a border at the bottom, and often images that run through it that connect top to bottom, and then a main narrative sequence that sits in the middle. So that is the formal arrangement. Then there is a thing called the real, realism. Um, 
this drawing is dependent on a degree of realism. It has a person who holds a pot, who is confronted by a snake who's going up a tree. This stuff isn't realism. This is decorative order. And there is a decorative line. There is a decorative line running through it. If for no other reason than it was a decoration on the wall of a villa. So what I've done is then looked for the junctions along these lines where other things bounce along this line. And I've said that basically it starts with the Egyptian, it then moves towards the Etruscan, which is a pre-Roman civilization that um, was uh, greatly influenced by art from India. In fact, a lot of the Etruscan artists were imported from India and that was then taken up by the Romans. So I've got a kind of historical uh, picture of the main themes in art being driven through geographical locations and periods. So these two scrappy little bits of paper are actually, in the end, full of quite dense information. Now, if I can show you how these ended up as kind of artworks, um, I, um, they became two images in a frame that would, this is uh, Caravaggio, and this shows us how Caravaggio um, connect, connects John White, who was an early English painter, and Velasquez and Las Maninas. And um, we're looking at a connection that is brokered through formalism, decoration, expression, which we don't see a lot of there, the real, and um, they all kind of combine together to produce these images. So, boxes full of drawings like that. Now, So let's get, go back to this idea of mapping drawing. Now, I'm working this in real time so that, um, uh, you know, I started with drawing landscapes, I went on to drawing diagrams, and now this is my third attempt at finding a way of drawing drawing. And what I did was just imagine that I had a pile of 200 drawings and that um, I wanted to get them into some kind of order. And I rejected the idea that they would be classified by who made them, or uh, what they were drawn with, or how big they were, or when they were made, and went for the idea that it was, what were they trying to do? What was the point of these drawings? You know, what is the point of a map to find your way from A to B, to understand where you are in the world? What is the point of a portrait to remember or to discover what somebody looks like, um, and so on. So it's about thinking about what is the point of the drawing. And I would, you know, before I actually get to this next section of drawings, I would say that if you can work out what the point of a drawing is, you can often then work out whether it's a good or bad drawing. It's not about taste. It's about does it do the job it sets out to do? And that will determine how good the drawing is. So, um, for example, most ordnance survey maps are brilliant drawings because they do what they set out to do, which is accurately map the surface of the earth and allow people to find their way around the earth and plan movements across the earth. Um, so they are excellent drawings. Um, it's sometimes very difficult to work out what a drawing is for, especially within fine art, because um, you know I think probably quite often even the artists don't know what they're for. They do them, they're, they're outspillings, but they don't quite understand what they are for. So, they, you know, a lot of drawings present very big challenges, but I took on the challenge with this, and I decided that there were basically two different kinds of drawing. There were pictorial drawings, which are like that, pictures of things you can recognise, give names to. And then there are conceptual drawings, which are like maps, um, are like uh, musical scores. Um, they don't have recognisable images, but you begin to say, well, that stands for railway station and connecting escalators, and that stands for track running between there and there, but it stands for it, it instead of it, it isn't it. Whereas um, people really do believe that, you know, a, a nicely drawn portrait is as real as the person in some ways. So we've got the two types, conceptual and pictorial. And so we've got two filing cabinets, one that takes pictorial and the other takes conceptual. Each filing cabinet has four drawers and each drawer takes a different kind of drawing. 
You will see that the words descriptive and instructive, descriptive, instructive, descriptive, instructive, are repeated through. So there's two types of drawing that I'm talking about. A descriptive drawing is one that um, tells you what something looks like. Uh, it is the plans for um, the building of the shard. Um, uh, but then there are instructive drawings, which are the ones that are drawn for the engineers so they can get the metal cut, the right shape, make the right joints. And they are instructing craftsmen and, and, and uh, manufacturers how to make things. Whereas the descriptive one is really aimed at the client. It tells the client, this is what it's going to look like when it's all bolted together. Now, within that, there are two other subcategories which are definitive and speculative. So a speculative drawing is one that says, well, it could be like this, it could be like that. And let's see what it looks like if I add more windows. Let's see what it looks like if I take out that staircase. The definitive drawing is one that you end up with and says, it is like this. So a definitive uh, instructive drawing is the iconic image of a um, female figure on the door of a toilet. Um, it's not a, you know, is this a man, is this a woman? It's a woman. Uh, sometimes I do look at them and get confused, but uh, that's probably my own idiocy. Um, but it's supposed to be a definitive image and it's supposed to be instructive. It's not describing the toilet for the benefit of those who are interested in toilets. It is saying, women in, men stay out. Now, so you wouldn't expect to see a speculative, descriptive drawing on the wall of a, on the door of a toilet, unless somebody was um, applying some graffiti to it. So what we end up with is um, drawers full of similar, similarly motivated drawings. Now, interestingly, that is a pictorial drawing of that state of affairs. And here it is as a conceptual drawing where they're just balloons. There's pictorial, conceptual, instructive, definitive, and they all weave together to make this pattern. And that's probably the sort of thing you see more often in people's essays and uh, uh, PowerPoint presentations of saying, this is how the world works. Um, and this is a pictorial version of it. So for a while, I stuck with that as my picture of drawing. Now, we can have another break and look at some actual drawings. And this, these ones are quite fun. I purposely chose some fun drawings for you because um, it isn't all dull, boring stuff. You know, being an artist and being a designer, it should be a hell of a lot of fun. And it isn't all full of bags of theory. I just um, give you this theory as a once and only thing because it's kind of useful to think about and know it. It's not important in terms of making you a great designer, but it's good for you to know it because um, nobody ever told me when I was at college what drawing was. They just said, do it, you know? <laughs> and, and it's quite nice to know roughly what you're doing. And I mean, I can tell you what you're doing when you draw. You are making two-dimensional representations of multi-dimensional events. And the reason you're doing it is to understand them more fully and be able to explain what you're doing to other people. So, you know, the human voice is very important in this. When you make drawings, um, a lot of the time you're going to be standing with a client and talking about that drawing. The drawing is not really always very good at speaking for itself. It's great when it does. Some drawings do speak for themselves, but in general they have a vocal or a textural accompaniment. They have to have words written on them. Now, these drawings I made um, uh, by cutting up a Sotheby's auction catalogue. And um, there are all these very expensive paintings with their captions, and it says lot 445, and it's a painting by Kim Shang Yul, and it was made in 1929. And um, what I did was cut a section out of the painting and um, then draw on it and turn it into a handbag. So what I've done is turn the Sotheby's catalogue of paintings um, into a set of handbag designs just by drawing on top of the images in the magazine leaving the label that was attached to it um, in the catalogue 
and it's even got the price of the painting on there. So these are, I mean, this is an expensive handbag and it's um, 20,000, 30,000 pounds and it takes a section of that designer's painting as the decorative motif on it. And um, there's one by MR, um, that's a 25,000 pound handbag as well that I've made. This one I rather like, I think I could probably sell this one at Louis Vuitton or something. It's a Barbara Kruger painting that I've turned, done in 1945, turned into a handbag. This one is uh, uh, Boetti, who was a great Italian painter and made tapestries. And um, a project like this, uh, I spent two afternoons doing it because I didn't really want to throw the catalogue away, so I thought I'd keep bits of it. This is a Stubbs, you know, the English um, painter, and this is an anatomy drawing that I turned into a handbag. That's quite funny because that, that's actually what got me thinking about the whole thing. That um, a, a Japanese painter did a painting that was like a Louis Vuitton pattern and I turned it back into a handbag. And that's where I started. This one I like very much is a real good abstract one. It was sort of like stars in the sky and it's by Thomas Demand. And um, that's 60 to 80,000 pounds that painting cost before I cut it up. And so on. So that's me having fun here. Wayne Tebow, he's a great West Coast American painter. These are uh, bubblegum machines. So, um, well, I'm showing you these. I'm, I suppose I'm showing to you, well, collage is drawing. I'm using uh, found objects and text um, as prototypes for what might become paintings. I will never paint these. I, I just can't see myself doing it, um, not unless somebody paid me to do it. But, um, uh, it's an idea and it will stay in this box probably for the rest of my life and maybe somebody will um, find them one day and find something to do with them. And that's what happens these. I did those in 2010, put a label on it, put it on a shelf and put them away. So these really are my sketchbooks. I do keep sketchbooks. Um, sketchbooks are extremely important things to me, um, but I tend to transfer anything of any worth out of a sketchbook and put it into pages like these and into boxes. Now, we're very near to the end. Um, as a professor of drawing, uh, I never did stop trying to draw drawing, and I'm now going to show you my last um, and most recent attempt at drawing drawing. And um, there it is. That is drawing. It's, it's gone from being a landscape to a map to uh, a kind of pictorial image of furniture that you imagine to be full of drawings to um, something almost like um, a kind of imagined sci-fi cartoon world where potatoes sprout eyes and come to life and talk to each other. They're like, I see them as like little robotic beasts. And um, this does need a voiceover. I'd be intrigued if I gave this to somebody, um, uh, whether they could work out what was going on, because it's very complicated. I think they might, if they were kind of smart and put their mind to it, but um, I'll give you the voiceover and make life easy for you. Um, I hope you can see all of it. It doesn't really matter if you can't. I'll hold up a section like that. And um, what I'm saying now is that there are one, two, three, four, five, six different kinds of drawing. There is technical drawing, plans, elevations, geometry, dress patterns. And there I am naming the types. There are diagrams, which are different from technical drawings. Um, and in diagrams, you get wiring diagrams for putting electricity into a building. Um, you get uh, flat pack construction diagrams, like when you go to Ikea and get some furniture, you get diagrams that show you how to put it together. And weather maps, I think, are diagrams. Um, then mapping is a very, very important part of drawing, and there are pictorial maps, as I've already told you, there are conceptual contour maps, um, and then there are charts, and 
then certain kinds of drawing are like mapping, and I, I do believe that, say, Leonardo da Vinci's anatomical drawings are a kind of mapping, mapping where the muscles are or where the blood vessels are. Then there's scoring, which is right on the edge of drawing, because um, a lot of scoring is to do with um, music, and this is a very abstract form of drawing, and... Um, it, it, uh, it's kind of an, a, a notational form of drawing. But also within scoring, there is a tally marks. Do you know what those are? Where you, if you're in prison and um, you've been locked up in solitary confinement, you scratch a line for every time the sun goes up. And when you've got six lines, you put a diagonal across it, and that is a week. And then you can tell how many weeks you've been in jail. So that's tallying. And then there are deletion marks, which are, it's not writing, but just crossing out. That's a scoring. You score things out. Um, that's a very particular kind of drawing. Then there's tracing. And uh, tracing um, is a um, very, very interesting area that, um, if the most interesting I can give you, one of the most brilliant drawings in the world is the sundial, which, um, by where the shadow is cast, um, you can put a uh, numerical system under it and tell what time of day it is. And it's amazing because uh, um, Ptolemy was one of the inventors of the sundial. And, you know, this is um, 500 years before Christ. And um, he has worked out through the movement of the sun, sorry, the movement of the earth against the sun and the geographical location of this point that you can determine what time of day it is and not only what time of day it is what month you're in and and so and it's a relationship between you knowing where you are and where the sun is and this called the gnomon casts a shadow which is a tonal drawing that is kinetic so if you can imagine the 500 years before christ people were doing kinetic tonal drawings that were driven by light it's pretty amazing compared to um, the pencil and paper that we more conventionally draw with. So, in fact, tracing is a very interesting area. And then after that, the most common of all, sketching, which is basically drawing what's in front of you with the pencil. Now, what is going on at the top, and I think we should just concentrate on one of these at the moment, um, because they all really tell a very similar story. But if we look at technical drawing, what I'm saying is that basically... There, this is a kind of Leonardo da Vinci-esque situation where you've got three lobes in the brain and instead of them being lobes that have different functions, I'm saying that one of them looks after the written, one looks after the drawn, and the other looks after the notational. Okay? And really what is driving all of this is our eyesight. We are seeing stuff that is triggering us to want to output information as either written, drawn, or notational. And the first thing we do after we've decided whether it's going to be drawn or written, and in this case, because these ones have lit up and these have stayed softer, we are um, looking for a drawn or notational outcome that is going through a filter called pictorial as opposed to conceptual. And then it goes into this, like a kind of liver type organism, where it can either be an improvised image or a systemic image, one that is made according to a system. And so we've got a drawn and notational pictorial image that is systemic that then is measured. Now I'll show you this one because this has another organ in it, which is the improvised organ and then we've got them said so, but this one there is no improvisation possible in technical drawing i argue and so it goes through the measured and it becomes technical drawing and in the end it is output as a dress pattern so each one of these tracks how pictorial and conceptual improvisation and systemic estimated and measured works out in terms of the type of drawing so that is it. That is what I've ended up with as the drawing of drawing. It took me approximately seven years from beginning to the end of the project. Um, a lot of people have said, why did you bother? 
And um, the, of course, the smart answer to it is because I was paid to do it and I was willing to take the money and spend the time. But really, um, the reason I did it was that I did not know what drawing was and I was a professor of drawing. Uh, I knew what I did when I drew, but I didn't know what it was really that I was doing. And as a result of going through this, I mean, I think one important thing is that because I work in education, you do it to share it with other people. It's a challenge. You know, I challenge you to draw drawing. It's a, it's a very, very interesting thing to try and do. Um, you know, it's as interesting as trying to draw happiness or to draw love. You know, it, they're very complex things to draw. And um, I think that uh, much more complex than the last drawing that I'm going to show you. I do love drawing on Japanese paper because it folds up like cloth and it's strong and it's beautifully light and wonderfully absorbent. So this is mulberry paper. And um, this is a drawing of Washington DC that I did actually many years ago, about five years ago. No, 2009. That's not bad, five years ago, yeah. And um, this is the Potomac River. This is the Watergate building that's so famous for the um, downfall of President Nixon, Kennedy Center, the Mall, Washington Monument, the Capitol, Georgetown Hospital, construction site they were building there at the time, and um, DuPont Circus, Phillips Collection, and the Canal. And um, I'm actually just about to take this drawing back to um, Washington five years later, and I'm going to fill in just one more area. I'm just going to draw that area in, in a different ink, and um, then I'm going to say, it says July 2009, I'm going to put a dash, and I'm going to put October 2014. Um, because um, it always was incomplete, and um, I thought I would just try and examine the area. And the way that I do it is visit the place, walk around it, and draw. So, hopefully, that gives you some idea of what I think about drawing, and um, I think that the very end of this lecture I'd just like to say it's a very simple it's a very straightforward way of handing information and I would encourage you to try and draw every day because it's just like a pianist playing the piano you can't just expect to get up and perform uh, on a particular day you have to practice and drawing is probably the best way of practicing being a visual artist or designer have a great course and um, see you all again soon bye